Today I think we're going to talk about why tooth loss matters. So let's roll that intro and get into it. What's up everyone, Dr. Eric Jackson here. Hope you're all doing well. As I mentioned, today's topic is why tooth loss matters. When you first think of tooth loss, the first thing that comes to mind might be something along the lines of an unattractive appearance, an undesirable appearance. Nobody wants to have a space, a gap uh, in their smile, and I don't blame them. Uh, there are endless studies, psychological as well as dental, that show a massive correlation in um, a dissatisfied smile, a patient who has a dissatisfied smile, and how it impacts their rest of their lives. Sometimes uh, it can be interpersonal relationships. It can be a negative impact on interpersonal relationships. It can be a negative impact at a job. Um, it can be just negative impact internally, psychologically. Um, all these things are different for every single person, but ultimately it comes down to we certainly don't want to have a smile that we can't be proud of. Um, that doesn't mean everyone has to have a perfect textbook smile, uh, by no means. But with that said, it has to be functional, it has to be uh, satisfying to the, to the individual who owns it, right? Um, but really, let's go a little bit deeper. So in addition to the cosmetics of it all, let's talk about the biology, the dentistry of it. So when you lose a tooth, a lot of things can happen that may have ne many negative consequences, um, including bone loss, uh, shifting and drifting of teeth, bite changes, difficulty chewing and speaking, wearing down of your remaining natural teeth, and even changes in your jaw joint, your TMJ. So let's go through these each briefly uh, to give a little bit more understanding of the topic as a whole. So first, bone loss, right? So bone loss, what, well, the, why is there gonna be bone loss? Um, when you lose a tooth, or when a tooth needs to be removed, uh, the body is very efficient, right? The body's not gonna allocate resources where it's not needed, and the purpose of the jawbone is basically twofold. One, the full volume of the jawbone is there when the teeth are there. When the teeth are not there, the body says there's no reason to allocate the full volume of jawbone, so it shrinks down. You've seen this ph phenomenon in patients with full dentures, especially patients who have had full dentures for many decades. Their uh, faces are shrunken in, their jaws are kind of um, older and elderly looking, so to speak, right? And you have that uh, bone loss on a kind of generalized scale. The entire jaw uh, has been shrunken down. Well, the same phenomenon happens on a small scale with just one tooth coming out. Uh, you, their body will actually shrink the bone, uh, keep it as efficient as possible to then allocate less resources to it. It's very uh, logical when you think about it that way. There's no reason to support anything because there's nothing to support. Um, that does cause issues. When you have bone loss, it begets other things. Tooth. Right, number two, shifting and drifting teeth. Well, when you lose a tooth, or you, you, know, you need a tooth extracted, um, the, the teeth, they're always in synergy, right? They're always moving. It's a common misconception that after a certain age, your teeth are no longer drifting and shifting. Um, it's just not the case. They're always moving, they're always potential for movement, and you'll see this because someone, especially in a, in a molar area, um, or a premolar area, they're going to have a space, and then the neighbor teeth will have a tendency to kind of tip and drift into that space, um, as well as the top tooth, the opposing tooth, will have a tendency to kind of drift into that space too. Teeth, they like to have contact points to keep them in spot. That's why when you have your orthodontic results, you get an ideal textbook orthodontic result. Every single tooth is nicely aligned. Every single tooth has a contact point in between it, and that's going to keep it both horizontally uh, in place and stable because it's touching the neighbors, but also it's going to have a contact, uh, multiple contact points with the opposing tooth on the top or bottom jaw, and it's going to keep it vertically stable. So you're going to have horizontal stability and vertical stability with an ideal orthodontic case, or even, frankly, with a natural bite. Uh, teeth will drift and seek out these contact points, especially when you um, lose a tooth. So that can be a problem because there's no semblance to, there's no re rationale behind the drifting um, when it's left up to mother nature. So it kind of just goes where it wants to, and that can cause issues, especially in the lower front. So somebody with 
a lot of over jet, right? A very uh, top teeth that stick out much further from the bottom teeth. Those bottom teeth have a tendency to kind of drift up over time. So far, uh, sometimes you'll see them even pushing into the gums on top behind the front teeth. And that can be very uncomfortable. It can be a, certainly a problem for many other uh, dental and orthodontic reasons, which uh, we don't need to get into here. My point is that shifting and drifting teeth is usually never a good thing unless it's controlled by orthodontic movement. So in addition, number three, bite changes. Bite changes go along with the shifting and drifting, right? Um, if the tooth is left to kind of drift around, well then now it's no longer hitting properly. It's not optimized, it's not hitting flat. Maybe it's tipping, maybe it's tipping a little bit and now it's just hitting on one point uh, instead of the whole bite surface. That's a problem because ultimately you're going to then lead to other issues and these are all kind of domino effect. The first domino that falls is the tooth being removed. The second domino that falls is the drifting and shifting and the bone loss. Then you get into these other following dominoes. For example, the next one is difficulty chewing and speaking. Um, when you have a missing space, uh, depending on the location, it'll affect your phonetics. Now phonetics is the, the fancy term for uh, the ability to say certain sounds, right? Um, the, the F sound, f, f, like, you know, it, that's that sort of thing, like 55, that's very important as far as where your front top teeth are in relation to your lip and where they, they touch the lip. 66 is another phonetic that we use a lot in dentistry. It depends on how much space there is between your front teeth um, in order to make that S sound. 66, if there's too much, uh, it gets sloppy. And if there's too little, you just can't do it. Try saying these words with a little bit of variance, right? 66 sounds normal when you say it. Uh, and if you have your teeth in roughly the right position, but if you say it too open, shikshti shiksh, it sounds like somebody with an ill-fitting or ill-designed part, uh, partial or a full denture. Shikshti shiksh means that there's too much space. And if you say it with too little, 66, it sounds like you can't make the noise at all. So you've got to find the right amount of space to make that noise. When you have a missing tooth, especially in the front teeth, Air has a tendency to kind of get through because it's just an extra space and no, there's no more teeth there. So that can be a very um, sizable obstacle for speaking normally. Um, it's a very important uh, thing, especially for the patient, uh, but as well as the dentist. Chewing can be hampered as well. Um, when you're missing front teeth, when you're missing back teeth, the different styles of chewing. Front teeth are intended to be more or less scissors when they slice things in the front. When you have a back tooth, you're a grinding mortar and pestle style. Um, one missing tooth may not hamper that much depending on it, where the location. It still might, but it may not. But when you start adding multiple teeth, you start having to use um, front teeth for grinding and clenching. You start having to use back teeth for slicing. And that's not what really they're designed for. Um, the physical shape of the teeth is very intentional. Um, as you go from front to back, they go from slicers to the eye teeth, which are kind of tearing, much you know, canine teeth, just like you would tear into a, a piece of meat if you were a dog. And then you go further back, the, the premolars are somewhat hybrids. They're kind of a little bit of front teeth, a little bit of back teeth, a little bit of molars. And then the molars, of course, being very large, they are the grinding mortars and pestles. Problems happen when you use back teeth to slice or you use front teeth to grind. Um, it can be done, it's done all the time, unfortunately, because of missing teeth. And that's one main reason why tooth loss matters, is because you're going to have these difficulty chewing, uh, these difficulties chewing and difficulty speaking, and it's gradual uh, at times. Other times it's rather, rather quickly, like with the speaking, when you lose the tooth, the air will rush through. Let's talk about what misuse of these teeth uh, it will lead to. Um, using a front tooth as a grinder, what will happen to it? Well, you're going to wear down uh, that tooth. You're actually even going to potentially cause it a much more harm than just physical wear. When you're using it, it'll have a tendency to get mobile. Um, you're overusing it. And anytime you overuse a part of your body, it wears down faster, both physically uh, and then physiologically as well. The tooth will not be able to handle the added load. Um, but even just regular bite 
surfaces. Say, you, say you're, you've only missing one tooth. Um, you had to have one tooth out. Well, you're logically using the rest of the teeth more. Um, you're going to probably, as the patient, shy away from that space. You're going to chew elsewhere because it's much more efficient to chew on the side that has the full complement of teeth than the side that has one missing tooth. Um, everyone has one favorite side, and that can change. Um, not everyone has, um, you know, for a lifetime or whatnot, and you can consciously change that as well. But ultimately it comes down to once you have some teeth that are uh, missing, uh, teeth that have been drifted into the area, teeth that have changed their bite and are no longer as efficient as they used to be, uh, these sorts of changes happen uh, unconsciously, uh, subconsciously. They are um, just part of your normal routine because your body knows if I chew here, I can't chew as well, so I'm going to chew over here. This causes issues. You're going to wear down those teeth. You're also going to hit our last point here. You're going to potentially cause distress and damage to your jaw joint, your TMJ. Now, your temporomandibular joint is what TMJ stands for, and you have one on the right and the one on the left. Um, most common, uh, the, 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 the common vernacular is you, you get TMJ. Well, TMJ is the actual anat anatomical part of your body. What you do when you have TMJ, so to speak, you have what's more accurately called TMD, temporal mandibular disorder or temporal mandibular distress, right? You're gonna have symptoms coming from the joints. Well, and that's a problem because ultimately it comes down to if you're chewing more on one side or if you're chewing harder on one side or if things are just out of whack, you're going to then translate that force up into the jaw and you're gonna be working on it longer. Um, more force equals more wear, just like we said for the teeth, but it also applies for the jaw joint. Um, imagine if you've got, you know, the same idea, um, a, uh, an injury, an old sports injury to your hip or to a knee, you're going to have a tendency to kind of limp a little bit and you're going to favor things, but that does throw off everything. It throws off your spine, talk to any chiropractor, they're going to say, ultimately you have to have everything in alignment, you want to have everything nice and even, um, nice synergy between everything, and that's a hard thing to accomplish for the hundred years of your life. Many of those concepts are the same in dentistry. You want to have even distribution of forces between your right and left sides of your mouth. Uh, you want to have everything hitting properly top and bottom. And everything ideally should be nice and symmetrical and in line. So these are really a lot of very, very brief uh, touches. I mean, this is the concepts of um, everything from modern orthodontics to modern restorative dentistry to modern implant dentistry, uh, which is actually a good way to finish this. Well, what do we do about a missing tooth. Well, you can absolutely leave that space. We've just gone through uh, multiple reasons why that has some potential pitfalls, but ultimately it comes down to, as I tell my patients, these are not um, typically dire, acute, urgent type things that you must fix right away. It is a great thing to fix right away, but must is a big difference than should, right? Um, what can you do? Well. Um, while you heal or while you, you figure out uh, what plan you want to do, uh, you'll be okay. But with, you should start having a plan of attack. You should know your short, medium, and long term. So your short term is you're okay in the short term. Your medium and long term, though, starts getting into these, these um, negative consequences like we've talked about prior to this, to this uh, point in the video. Um, what can you do? Well, the traditional options are three. A removable partial denture. Um, which is great, frankly. Um, a lot of times people look down on it because it comes in and out, but really it serves a wonderful purpose. It is a simple, non-surgical method to replace one, but usually multiple missing teeth for a uh, economical price, right? You're not going to end up um, breaking the bank compared to the other two options when you go with a partial. And it's a very, very effective way. It has plenty of cons, but it also has plenty of pros. So I always offer uh, in addition to leaving it alone, you, uh, you talk about a partial. You also talk about a fixed bridge, a cemented bridge. A bridge being much like the bridge you would drive over, over, over a river. Um, go ahead and imagine that. It's cemented down on the adjacent teeth. It will then keep those teeth horizontally stable as well as it will keep uh, a vertical dimension because you're going to then place a fake tooth called a pontic in the middle and that will then restore your smile. It doesn't come in and out. It stays permanently uh, cemented, and you're, in good, you're gonna be in good shape as far as all these 
uh, negative consequences because you've restored the area. The final option is that a, a dental implant, a surgical option, um, provided that there's enough bone volume, provided that there's a lot of things there, you may be very el you may be eligible for an implant to be placed into the bone. A screw uh, is placed into the bone, and then a restoration, a crown is placed on top of the screw. Basically, an implant is a screw is a uh, screw that is a tooth replacement system. The implant replaces the root, and then the restorative portion on top replaces the what we call the clinical crown or the visible part of the tooth. So really, um, it is a wonderful option because you're not changing the neighbor teeth, you're not uh, affecting anything in that regard. It's very cosmetic, um, it's, it's a wonderful option. It is probably the most expensive. Not everyone's a candidate for it because you have to do, um, have to have sufficient uh, bone volume and, and that's a whole different video. We can talk about that some other time. But ultimately, that can be addressed by the surgeon with grafting and things like that as well. So really it comes down to all four options leaving it empty space, partial denture, fixed bridge, and dental implant are all viable options for everybody at different stages of their lives and at different points in their treatment. The key is knowing where you are in the uh, progression of the game, so to speak, so that way you can make the best decisions. And that comes with conversations with your dentist and dental providers, um, <clears throat> talk to the front desk, uh, as well as your dentist, as well as your dental hygienist, all about different aspects to this, because this is a wildly complicated and in-depth topic that is far longer than this simple video. Um, and the best part about it is you can never go wrong with good conversation. Communication is key with dentists and patients. In this day and age, that's the very reason why I have this uh, YouTube channel, because it starts to stimulate conversations between not only my patients, but hopefully patients in other offices with their dentists. And it's great because that dentist can then pick up uh, the ball where I, you know, I pass it to them, pick up where I left off, and then talk, then talk about their specific, uh, their case, their patient's specific case. Um, something that I simply just can't do here on this channel, obviously. Uh, so, with all that said, two thoughts absolutely matters. I hope that you were able to, we went through this really quickly, um, in order to keep it under, you know, under 20 minutes or so. But ultimately it comes down to, um, if you have any questions, as always, uh, Put them in the comments below, um, I'll answer them. Uh, as always, if you like this kind of conversation, this kind of communication, please feel free to like the video, uh, subscribe to the channel, and then uh, most importantly, have a very good rest of your day. I wish you all the best, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks so much, bye-bye now.